But in the visual was working, the audio wasn't. So I was working on the audio and the visual went out too. <coughs> Oh, so we didn't have any, and now we got them both up together, thanks to the Lord, amen. All right, Leviticus. Well, one man named Leviticus, the liver and onions of the Bible. You either like it or you don't, honey, I'm going to tell you what. Hey, you know why they missed the importance of this book? Notice with the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, Leviticus is the center point got Genesis and then Exodus and then you've got Numbers, Deuteronomy and then in, right in the middle you've got the book of Leviticus. Now Moses has been up on Mount Sinai. God has given him the moral law. Exodus chapter number 20, that's who you are inside. That's what you are here. Then he gave them the civil law. That's how what's in here works uh, with people around you, all right? Without law, again, you've got anarchy. So thank God for our laws today, and our laws are based on the Mosaic law. Uh, but I thank the Lord for law. So we've got the, the moral law inward, the civil law outward. Now, what we've been dealing with in Leviticus is as important, if not more important, than, than either one of the others. Because it's ceremonial law. It's how you approach God. Again, let me say that when God put the book of Leviticus in here, he's telling them that you don't approach God just any way you want to. Uh, hey, you don't do that. You know, people think God just takes every bit of junk that they throw at him nowadays. God doesn't do that. God operates. He's a holy God according to the word of God. And uh, let me put my... Let me put my bulletin back. I'll hide it over here. Amen. So in chapter number eight, we find that Moses has offered the Levitical law. He's, he's made the offerings thus far because he's showing Aaron how and what to do. Uh, if you go back through the building of the tabernacle, God gave Moses the specifications uh, up on Mount Sinai. When he came down, God gave him the men with the ability to do the work that needed to be done. And he gave them the specifications for them to build. They built every article of the tabernacle. Then they brought it to Moses one piece at a time. And he inspected everything to make sure that it was done the way it needed to be done. Then when it was inspected, everything's right, all the material, all of the uh, pieces of furniture, everything was right. Then he had them to put this thing together. Matter of fact, the Bible said that it took a year. It was a very slow process. First time they do something, you know, first time you do something, you, you, you just got to make sure you get it right. After that, you get a little better out of it. Now, the tabernacle was something that was uh, able to take down and put back up. So they got good at what they were doing. Now, they had got the tabernacle right, so now they've got to get the approach right. That's what Leviticus is all about. It's about the ceremonial law or how that you approach God himself. So in chapter number eight, uh, Moses just simply showed uh, uh, Aaron how to do it and, and, and what to do. Now, I want to look at these sacrifices just for a few minutes. In chapters one through three, we got the instructions concerning the sacrifices. Chapter four, he dealt with sins of ignorance. Aren't you glad this morning that God takes care of you when you don't know you're doing wrong? And by the way, sins of ignorance still had to be covered, but the priest sacrificed for the sins of ignorance of the people. He did that. They didn't sacrifice for themselves because they didn't know they'd even sin. So he dealt with these sins of ignorance, and they were hey, both omission and commission. You need to understand there's two ways to sin against God. One, commission, that's by things you do. But then by omissions, that's by not doing the things that you need to do. You know, Paul dealt with that over in Romans chapter 7. He said, the things that I would do, I, I do not. He said, the things that I'm not to do, he said, that's the things that I end up doing. So you can sin by not 
doing what God told you to do. I go back to Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. You can sin, but just simply staying at home. You can sin by not reading your Bible. You can sin by not spe spending time in prayer. You can sin by just simply not handing out a track. You can sin in a lot of ways by what you do not do, and then you sin in a lot of ways by what you do. Now, chapter number five through six, he dealt with sins of presumption. You, your trespass offerings, your sin offerings, what's a sin of presumption? Trespass means there's a line drawn. You understand what that line is, but you step over that line anyway. A lot of times when we knock on doors, people have no trespassing signs in their yard. Now, what does that mean? That means you don't trespass in their yard, or right? you stay on the sidewalk. I've, I've, we've, I've been out with some soul winner, and they say, well, we, we're soul winners. We don't pay any attention to that. I believe they have a perfect right to tell you to stay out of their yard. If they don't want to hear the gospel, they have a right to not hear the gospel, just like they have a right to hear the gospel. So what, that it, a trespass is something that has a line drawn. So he dealt with the trespass and the sin offerings and set them up. Chapter number eight, we find the consecration and the anointing of the high priest. Uh, back in chapter number eight, the beautiful type of our Lord Jesus Christ it uh, started out in verse number one and two, and the Mo Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and they brought the garments, the anointing oil. They washed these priests, they dressed these priests, they anointed these priests in a right way. It was not something that Aaron did. It's interesting, it was something that was done to Aaron. Aaron did not wash himself, they washed him. Aaron did not dress himself, they dressed him. Aaron did not anoint himself, they anointed him. I believe that you bring that to the New Testament church, that how this pastor is in this pulpit is according to how the people wash him, how they dress him, how they anoint him. Hey, I believe you have a huge obligation to the priesthood and then he has a huge obligation to you. Now, and I call this priesthood, it's not a priesthood. That's a wrong word to use for that. We don't live in days of priests. The priesthood died with the Old Testament. We're individual priests. But at the same time, God had the order for his men and the people had to set him up. He had to be qualified, but they helped him in the ministry. This is a reciprocal thing. Uh, I've often said that in the Old Testament, a shepherd was not a sheep. But in the New Testament, the shepherd is a sheep. He's one of the sheep of the house of God, and he's one come out from among you that God has set in order to preach the word of God and to oversee the work of the church. So in chapter number eight, we find he sets up a beautiful type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in our life. Listen, he's already clean. He's filled, he fulfilled all the law. But at the same time, our approach unto God has to be right. Our approach unto Christ. Uh, one thing that I've seen over the Bible Belt in the last few years is a disrespect for who Jesus Christ is. You've got a lot of people, they think he's, little, he's their little buddy, the little friend that follows them around. Let me tell you, he is a thrice holy God. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he needs to be elevated in that matter by the people. Now, when we get to chapter 9, this is where we're picking up this morning. All the offerings are made. Now they've got the priest ready. What happens, chapter number 9, I want you to look at the first words. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. Now, they're, they're going to bring these offerings to God in these verses. 
He went on and said, verse 5, they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Now, what he's going to do, for the first time, Aaron is going to offer sacrifices. Go back and read these first sacrifices as they were made. They were actually made by Moses. Moses was teaching Aaron how to do these things. God told Moses how to do them. And he's a beautiful type of Christ here. And now we are taught by the word of God how to do things. What he did, the first of these sacrifices, <clears throat> if you go back to it, Moses actually did them. For the first time in chapter number nine, Aaron is going to offer a sacrifice. First time he's done this. He's doing it under the watch, care, and the eye of Moses, and he's got to do this thing right. So he's been taught to do it right. So now they're taking these sacrifices. They bring them. The congregation comes and stands before the Lord. <clears throat> Part my throat this morning. Look at verse 6. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do, and the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Now, he says, this is what God told you to do. If you do this thing right, the glory of the Lord is going to appear unto you. I believe that things within the church have to be done decently and in order. They need to be done that way. It's, uh, when you come to worship, it's not just everybody does their thing the way they want to do their thing. I believe that you ought to have order in the house of God. You ought to do things right. I believe in tradition. You ought to do things traditionally. Now, let me re-explain tradition. Tradition, there's nothing wrong with tradition. The Bible said that we're to keep the traditions of our fathers. The only thing that makes a tradition wrong, there's two things. One, when it is against the Word of God. If you do something traditionally that is against the Word of God, your tradition needs to be done, done away with. The second thing is when you teach tradition to be a commandment of God. It's not a commandment of God. We do things traditionally here in a lot of ways. We normally have the Lord's table, uh, the fifth Sunday of the quarter. All right. That gives you four different times during the year, and then if you want on special occasions or whatever. Some people have the Lord's table every Sunday. Some people have it once a month. Some people have it just all different types. You know, the Lord said as often as you do this, there's nothing in the Bible that tells you how many times a year to have the Lord's table. It doesn't tell you that. So a lot of times we do things traditionally. There's nothing wrong with doing it on the fifth Sunday of the quarter. There's nothing wrong with doing it every Sunday morning. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to do it that way, that's fine, as long as it doesn't become common. You've got to be careful that it does not become common. This is a remembrance of what God has done, and it's easy for things to be done. There's no saying uh, familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, you get used to things, and then all of a sudden they don't mean to you what you need to be. Uh, often, uh, well, I'm just going to leave this, this, that illustration out this morning. Amen. Uh, but hey, you, you, can, you can have it made uh, in the shade, as they used to say back in the 60s. I've got it made in the shade. You can have it made in the shade and not appreciate it. You can be a billionaire and not appreciate it. You know, most billionaires are not happy people. Most millionaires aren't you. Hey, you better, be, you better thank God that everybody here is working class. I thank the Lord for that. You know, God chose the poor to be rich in faith. Seems like the more things you have, the less you think you need God. And the richer you get, that's why he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they said, well, then who can go to heaven? Listen, he said, with God, all things are possible. Thank God you've got some rich people that actually love the Lord. And they use those riches not just to put up in the bank, but they use those in a right manner and use them for the glory of God. And I thank the Lord for that. But he told them here, he said, the Lord shall appear unto you. He said, you've got to do this in a right way. Look at verse 7. And Moses has said unto Aaron, 
Go unto the altar and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering and make an atonement for thyself and for the people. Now, this is not the first time atonement is used in the Bible, but it's the first time it's used with a tabernacle. I believe atonement has been since the Garden of Eden. The word atonement means to just put something off, to cover something for a time that'll be uncovered later and taken care of. You just, it's, a, it's an atonement. It's something that you do. It's, I, I've hyphenated at one minute. It's what kept, kept them right with God until the Christ would come and take away the sin of the world. But really, and I say, I believe atonement, it always has been. The first thing that happened in Genesis 3 was God slew an animal and made coats for a what? He made them for a covering. He covered the nakedness, their sin. He covered, uh, and, and the nakedness was not the sin. The Bible said when he made Adam and Eve that they were naked and they were not ashamed. The shame came with the sin. Sin's what brought the shame. They made coverings for their nakedness out of fig leaves to try to cover them. But hey, they just made aprons. God made a coat. He covered them all the way down, friend. But that's an atonement. What happened was that sin, once it took place in the garden, it had to be taken care of immediately. So immediately God made an atonement because it wasn't time for the Christ to come and take away the sin of the world. He made an atonement for Adam and Eve. And you find that all through the Old Testament. But now we find with the people, he's, I'm talking about the nation of Israel. First, this man is going to make an atonement for himself. I believe the pastor and the preacher needs to take care of his sin before he deals with the sin of anybody else. I think it's an important thing in the morning that he get forgiveness of sin, confession of sin. If he's got anything between him that's going to hurt, uh, he needs to take care of that first thing in the morning. Then when he stands up here, though he's not sinless up here, at least he's, he's walking with God when he comes in and because he's going to handle something very important. He's going to handle the Word of God. He's going to give a perfect standard to an imperfect people coming from an imperfect man. So he's got to be careful, one, to rightly divide it. And then two, he's got to rightly appropriate it. That's why when he's pre Timothy told him, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, and then with the doctrine of the word of God. So we find here that first he made an offering for himself and thy burnt offering, and make an atonement for thyself and for the people and offer the offering of the people and make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Now, for the rest of the Old Testament, they're going to have this same ritual that takes place. It's going to take place once a year. It's going to take place when the high priest will take that blood of that animal into the Holy of Holies He's going to put it in the right place. He's going to do it at the right time. Listen, the Bible said he goes in once a year and that not without blood. So he takes the blood of the atonement. What is it that takes away our sin? It's not the death of the animal. If the death of Christ took away the sin of the world, then the blood was just an afterthought. If Christ had died on that cross, if he was buried and resurrected and did not apply that blood. That's why when you get to New Testament, you find two ascensions of Christ. One, when Mary saw him and thought he was a gardener. And he said, Mary, she said, Rabbi, Rabboni, Master. She knew who he was and he made the statement, touch me not for I have not yet ascended unto my father, your father, my God, and your God. He was a purified priest and at that point in time, he couldn't be touched by anybody physically. Then later he told them, touch my hands, my side. They held him by his feet. What he did as a high priest, he put that blood on that mercy seat in heaven. Then he came back and then he walked with them for certain days and then he ascended back to heaven. So you find here the application of this blood had to be made right 
for the people was atonement. Every year he offered atonement. A lot of people think that Israel would have gone to hell if he hadn't offered an atonement. Listen, for 70 years they didn't make one. During the Babylonian captivity, there was no sacrifice. The temple had been destroyed. Solomon's temple had been destroyed. They didn't make sacrifices. There are none recorded. They made prayer. Daniel prayed before God three times a day. We find them in the captivity, but we find no sacrifices made. So this was an atonement for the nation of Israel itself. I believe the people still made personal uh, sacrifice through prayer and otherwise to God. But he said here, as the Lord commanded, you're going to make an atonement. Look at verse 8. Aaron therefore went unto the altar, slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood unto him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the call above the liver of the sin offering, he burned upon the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. Everything had to be done the right way. Verse 11, and the flesh and the hide he burnt with fire without the camp. Go to the book of Hebrews, we find that Christ died without the gate. The Bible says we're to go without the camp to him. He died outside of actually the city limits of Jerusalem and he died without the camp and they were to burn this outside of the camp. Look at verse 12, and he slew the burnt offering and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood which he sprinkled round about the altar and they presented the burnt offering unto him with the pieces thereof and the head and he burnt them upon the altar and he did wash the inwards and the legs and burnt them upon the burnt offering of the altar. What he's doing, he's doing exactly what Moses has commanded through God. God commanded Moses, this sacrifice had to be offered the right way. You couldn't just go out there and knock it in the head and drag it up there and throw it on the fire. Everything had to be washed right. Everything had to be done right. Everything had to be done in a peculiar manner. When you take the life of Christ, Christ did nothing that was unnecessary. Everything that he did was necessary. That's just like your Bible. Everything in here is necessary. Uh, a lot of people try to throw the Old Testament out because of Christ fulfilled the law. I think it's important in our types and, and to understand exactly what Christ did. We need the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament. I think it's important that we read it. It's important that we digest the Old Testament. But he took this blood, he did everything according to the manner he brought it, and he brought it right. Look at verse 15, he brought the people's offering. Now, he had his offering, and he took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and slew it and offered it for sin as the first. And he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to the manner. In other words, just exactly the way they did every other burnt offering. These burnt sacrifices or these burnt offerings had to be done in, in a certain way. The first mention of burnt offering was in Genesis chapter 8. And that's when uh, Noah got off of the ark and he made an offering unto God and the Bible used the terminology burnt offering. But I believe these same offerings, you go back to Genesis 3. Now this is just, I had, people would say your opinion I don't think God threw away the body of that animal. I believe he burned it. I believe he disposed of that thing in the right manner because these were the offerings that were made for sin. And he said after the manner, and I believe that what they're doing in the tabernacle goes back uh, to the patriarchs. I think they had burnt offerings. Uh, they offered for their sin. They offered it in the right way. But we find it had to be according to the matter. Look at verse seven. And he brought the meat and offering and took a an handful thereof and burned it upon the altar beside the burnt sacrifice of the morning. He took a meat offering along with the goat that he brought. Well, in the Bible, the meat offering or a meal offering, uh, a lot of people call it a grain offering. But the Bible calls it a meat offering. A meat offering is normally something that's eaten. 
Uh, back in the old days, we used uh, breakfast, uh, dinner, and supper. We used this terminology, uh, but according to where you're from, some of them are uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I, I, when people say, I want to invite you to dinner, I have to have them clarify, are you talking about at 12 noon or at 6 in the evening? Uh, kind of like the old fast time, slow time thing. You've got to find out what the terminology is when you do that. But what they did was, they, they brought this, they were offering grains, but they called it a meat offering. That's why Jesus said they set on meat, or he invited them to meat. Meat just simply meant that they were going to eat. They used that terminology in the Bible. So they brought this grain offering along with that. Verse 18, he said, he slew also the bullet and the ram for a sacrifice and peace offerings which was for the people and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled upon the altar round about. So now he's, he brought a peace offering along with the others. Look at verse 19, the fat of the bullet and of the ram, the rump and that which covereth the inwards and the kidneys, the call above the liver, and they put the fat upon the, the breast uh, and he burnt the fat upon the altars and the breast and the wave shoulder Aaron waved for a wave offering before the commandment of Mo, as Moses commanded, or before the Lord as Moses commanded. Now, you're noticing he's doing a lot of different offerings. If you look back over in, I think it's, uh, well, let me, let me don't get off on that right now, but he mentioned all of these offerings that uh, had to take place and how they were to be done. Uh, chapter seven, go back to chapter seven. Just hold your hand there. Why don't you look at verse number 37. And this is the law of the burnt offering, of the meat offering, of the sin offering, of the trespass offering, and consecrations of the sacrifice of the peace offering. There are six different types of offerings here that we find that had to be offered. Now, when you get over to chapter 9, you find that he is offering these. He's offering these in the way that God commanded them to be offered. But we find in verse number 22, And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them, and came down from the offering to the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. Now, he's done everything now that he needed to do. He's done it in the right manner. So what's verses chapter 1 through chapter 9? They deal with the sacrifices. Had to be done the right way. Had to be done with the right man. They had a high priest that did this. Uh, later, we'll get into sacrifices that people brought for different things uh, when you get in chapter 11 and following. But we find here that everything had to be done right. So God told Moses... Moses not only told Aaron, he showed Aaron. I, I've often thought about uh, young preachers. I think it's good for them to sit under old pastors. Uh, I, I believe they need to do that. I, I had one kind of taken a defense uh, pastor one time at that. But when I just, and I wasn't uh, demeaning his youth or or saying anything bad about it. You know, I'm just telling him, I think it's good for young preachers to sit under older preachers. Uh, you can be 35 years old and be an older preacher. If you've had a lot of experience, I'm not just talking, I've seen some old preachers that, hey, they didn't really know what the Word of God said anyway. And uh, so, but he's talking about here that they passed this on to make sure it was done right. Now he's done that. So Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and then they came back out. The Bible doesn't, doesn't say what they did in verse number 23, but I think there's a good possibility that was the first offering of the blood in the Holy of Holies that took place. They, they left the people. They made these sacrifices. They went into the congregation of that tabernacle. They stayed for a period of time, and then he and Moses came back out, and this is what they said. They came out and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. Look at verse 24. Aaron got it right. And there came a fire 
from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And when the, all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. We find this happened a couple of times. One with the tabernacle in the wilderness. When they got that thing right and they did that thing right, God showed his approval by the fire falling. The second time you find that is with uh, Solomon's temple. After Solomon had made that great prayer, the dedication to the temple, the Bible said the fire fell. It fell on that thing. The third time you find the fire falling is in Pentecost in chapter number two of the book of Acts. And the people were there together and they got that thing right and it, it, and it wasn't fire like it was in the Old Testament. It said as cloven tongues of fire. When God gave them the fullness of the Spirit of God, and then they went out, hey, they were going out now to do the work of God. You find the approval of God upon what they were doing. That's what he's talking about here in his verse, <clears throat> the approval of God. And that's what he said, when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. God approved of what they were doing through the sacrifices. And we get to chapter number 10, the first word is and. We're not going to get into 10, but immediately. Boy, isn't it interesting? They got it right. Moses got it right. Abram got it right. The people got it right. The power of God fell. God approved of what they did. And the next word is and. That takes you to just about the same time frame you get into the two eldest sons of Abram. Aaron actually had four sons, and they would follow him in uh, the age, the order of their age in the priesthood. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord, and God killed them. Interesting how quickly uh, people can just get away from the Word of God and get away from the things of God. Uh, you notice in our nation just over, and I'm, and I'm done for this morning, just over our lifetime, folks, I'm just 74 years old, but I have watched America go from uh, a, a nation with morals and structure. Uh, boy, back in the 50s and 60s, there were just things you didn't do. There were things you didn't say. There were places you didn't go. Now, you had people that slipped around and they did things in, in darkness. But I remember being raised in a different time and in my short lifetime, we're just talking about a generation, we have watched this nation as it has tumbled downhill, gone from morality uh, to no morality at all. Uh, gone, gone from structure to no structure, integrity to no integrity anymore. Boy, things have so changed. And I thank God I was raised old school. I was raised old school. I praise the Lord for that. Amen. But we find here that immediately in the children, it tells you that these children knew to do right. He brought his Aaron and his sons together when all this took place. They knew how to do it. They knew what to do. They knew how to do. They knew when to do. And yet we find that they decided to take it upon themselves to do it their way. I think Frank Sinatra sang that song so many years ago, I did it my way. They did it their way. Their way was not God's way. We're going to find there's a price that's associated with it. When you do something, but you don't do it God's way, it may look good to men. When they brought that ark back, old David thought it looked good on a new cart pulled by two oxen, buddy. He was dancing before the Lord, and he was having him a time, son. And buddy, when over by you reached up and, and, and touched that ark, when uh, the oxen stumbled, God struck him dead because he sought it not after due order. Later, he got it right. He brought that thing back and set it up the way he needed to. Amen. It's important we do things. God's way. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. Now, Lord, we're covering a lot of material now. We've already covered these chapters. Uh, but Lord, bring it to a conclusion. Uh, God gave the uh, commandments right. He told them how to do, when to do. 
And he told them why to do it. They did it right and found God's approval. Help us to find God's approval on our lives, on our church in these last days. I pray you'd bless now the service to come. Give us good day today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed to the prayer room.